hope everyone's sitting comfortably. I can only see the four of us, but I, I know there are a lot of people, a lot of people out there. So, uh, ladies and gents, welcome to the Foundation of Light Fixtures Breakfast, an event I've been hosting for quite a few years now, and I can honestly say this is a lot different to all the previous ones. Um, normally, of course, we get together third week of June for the fixtures. Uh, we're now two months later than that, in the, into August. Season's usually started. Um, but these are, of course, unusual times. So welcome to the wonderful world of, of Zoom from online meetings. And Tom does these regularly, being a businessman. Um, it's not even the smell of bacon sarnies wafting over from the from the back of the, from the back of the room here at the Beacon of Light. So I'm hoping you've, you're all settled with your teas and your coffees and uh, your sarnies and you're ready to hear what what's in store for the club this year. Um, First of all, well, thanks for joining us. Thanks for maintaining your enthusiasm for, for the club and for the foundation, which has been working extremely hard to help those who can least help themselves uh, during this pretty awful pandemic. Usually the housekeeping rules are about the toilets and the fire exits and things like that. Um, things to tell you today, if you have any technical problems, please type in the chat area. We do have IT support on call who can help you out if you're having any difficulties. Uh, don't type any questions to the panel though in, in the chat because we, I think we've already asked you to submit your questions um, ahead of the event. So we've got a few prepared for later on. Normally we open it up to the room, but I'm sure you'll understand that. Uh, I'll introduce the panel in just a moment, but while I've got your attention, I'll just point you towards a couple of events the Foundation's involved in, in with um, that are coming up soon. I'm sure one or two of you were looking to do the Great North Run this year, another event that's um, unfortunately fallen victim to the pandemic. So you can't do that, but what you can do is the virtual Great North Run. Now, at the copy of the race format, all runners will start at the same time and will complete the same 13.1 miles distance. All you need to do if you want to help the foundation and do a bit of running, keep yourself fit, register on the virtual Great North Run page, set up your fundraising page, which you can do through Just Giving, and you can start fundraising for the Foundation of Light. Every runner that raises at least £20 will receive a Great North Run medal. And the other event, which might maybe appeal to the younger audience, um, the Beacon of Light is going to host its first gaming tournament in partnership with Innovation Esports. Uh, I'm told it's an action-packed day of esports. Don't they all just sit there and, and do this? I don't know. Um, an action packed day of esports, and it is on Saturday, the 29th of August. Gaming fans of all ages can take part in a number of challenges and you can win cash prizes. So, if you're interested in that, have a look at the Beacon of Light website for more details and to book. Right, on with the fixtures breakfast. Then, on, on with the panel. Uh, and on our panel this year, uh, we have one ex player. Another who was close to being an ex-player and another who probably wishes he was a, a, an ex-player but never actually done that. So he talks about it on the telly instead. Yeah, he is, of course, Sky Sports presenter Dave Jones, along with fellow non-executive director Tom Sloans and former Sunderland defender Danny Collins. Five years at the club, two successful championship promotions and now on a podcast as well. Um, where do we start? Actually, we start with the podcast, Danny. How have you enjoyed that? It's SAFC Unfiltered. Yeah, it's been good. Obviously, uh, co-hosting alongside Frankie. Um, we've covered three episodes so far. Uh, a couple of the players, Bailey Wright and Chris McGuire, and uh, obviously the, the manager a couple of weeks ago. Um, so it's been interesting. I think it gives the fans a good insight into what's going on at the club. Uh, some light-hearted banter to go alongside it. You know, we've fired a few quiz questions at a few of the boys just to see how they're general knowledge is and um, just to get a feel of how things have gone early in pre-season so uh, I think it's gone down quite well so far with the fans. And and you, you're based up here now are you Danny? Is that where you're... Uh... I am yeah I live in uh, I live in Durham yeah so I'm not too far away. Uh, met, a, met a Sunderland last many years ago when I was up here and the North East brought me back up here so I'm enjoying it I love it up here yeah. Great and what is it about the club? I mean you had what five years here 150 odd games player of the year what is it about Sunderland that keeps bringing you back? No, I, I, I mean, Apart obviously, the yeah, I, I, yeah, the wife brought me back. No, I um, I joined 2004, obviously Sunderland were fourth, I think, at the time in the championship um, for myself. Coming from Chester, where I was in League Two, so it was quite a step up. But just to get a feel of the place, uh, obviously the size of the stadium, the training ground, 
the fan base, you know, when you're out and about around the town centre, you know, everyone's wearing their red and white striped shirts, whatever day of the week it is. And you just get a feel of how big football is for the city itself. And uh, it sort of grips you quite quick. And, you know, when you're going out there, certainly, you know, Premier League level and Championship level, um, you're coming up against the big teams and the fans are up for the games and the local derbies, you just, you get sucked in by the whole football theme of, of what it's all about for the fans and they live day to day for it. And as you say, I was five seasons it going into my sixth season before I left for Stoke. Um, enjoyed my football up here. As you mentioned, two promotions back to the Premier League. Um, played with some great players and uh, I just, just love the club. Nice job. Uh, Tom, I, come to you next, and I'm guessing most fans would will, will know a bit about Dave, but not so much about you. But you're a, a, a long-term fan. But tell us about the fact you, you were nearly a, play, a Sunderland player as well, were you? Oh, yeah. Uh, well... Uh, yeah, going back a long time, you know, I mean, uh, Charlie Ferguson, some people, uh, some of the older fans will remember Charlie was a, a scout at the club, you know, uh, many, many years ago. I had the opportunity to sign for Sunderland and I signed for Burnley, so don't ask us about that one, that's a long story. But um, um, no, I, yeah, I mean, I've been involved, you know, since I've, I've been going to Stadium of Light and uh, Roper Park since the 60s. Oh. Um, and I, I know I don't look it, but, um, but yeah, it's been a... It's been a very, very sort of long period of not many things to celebrate, you know, but I'm very much a person that looks forward rather than looks back, you know, and um, just just gagging to get on with the rest of the season, this season, you know. So how did you, how did the involvement with the club, you know, how did you take a step forward? Yeah, well, well, funny enough, uh, no, I've, I, well, like I said, I've, I've been a season ticket for, for, for many, many years, uh, got involved sponsoring the club uh, for the last two seasons. So last season, we give it uh, to one of the uh, charities, uh, Children with Cancer. Um, and yeah, I've just been involved a little bit on the commercial side, done a few functions. Uh, we did a, a function last year, funny enough, with Niall, Niall Quinn at the uh, stadium. Uh, uh, the foundation was one of the beneficiaries. Great night, you know, some great people over there. Um, so yeah, just, you know, I'm just, I'm just a massive fan and very, very fortunate to be on the board, to be honest with you, you know. Uh, but like in the same way, Danny, is sort of, you, you know, if you're, you're from, I was born 200 yards from Rooker Park and Bright Street, you know. Um, and it's it's pretty impossible to sort of like separate yourself from that, you know. So, so yeah, very fortunate, um, very frustrated, like everybody else is at the moment. I'm sure that'll come up in the conversation about what's happening, you know. Um, but but just dying to get back into it, really, you know. So so we can start looking at football and shouting at players and and doing all the things that we we really like to do, rather than what we're doing at the moment, you know. Smashing. And shouting at the telly as well, of course. We, we know all about that, uh, David. How's, how's lockdown been, uh, been for you? Is it a busy one? Or you just been sitting on a beach with a cigar? No, no football? Jeff, clearly not. You, you clearly didn't have Sky because um, <laughs> we did have a six week. All right, we had a little bit of a hiatus, but then we had a six week period where every single game was obviously being shown live on TV. And, and I did. Um, probably the lion's share of the, the, the 90 or so or 60 or so games that we had on Sky. So that was, that was quite full on and, and I was ready for a break at the end of that. Um, and then we've had, yeah, we've had a few weeks off and um, looking forward to, to getting back involved. I mean, actually, I start back with Sky on the same day that we play in the Carabao Cup. So we've got two England games, bizarrely, before the actual uh, Premier League season kicks off. Um, so we're going to have a jam-packed schedule from September all the way through to the back end of May. I've, I've been looking through, I can't see many gaps. And, and you know, if, if it's like that for the Premier League, we're, we're going to be playing a lot of midweeks uh, with Sunderland. And especially if, you, if, you, if we are successful in terms of the cup competitions as well, uh, that is going to get really squeezed, 46 games in a, in a much shorter period of time. It's going to be interesting, isn't it? Mm, it certainly is. I mean, j just to... Turn the clock back as well. The Sunderland connection to explain to people who, who maybe don't know and have only seen you on telly and, uh, and don't know the. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a it's a well trodden story, Jeff. But uh, I I grew up in the northeast, um, just near Middlesbrough, just south of Middlesbrough, North Yorkshire, and um, at the at the age where I was, you know, a very impressionable uh, young lad, about eight years old. Um, my friends were starting to go and watch Middlesbrough matches. My dad actually knew the Sunderland manager, Alan Durban, and was good pals with him and. Uh, he took us there to, to watch our first football. My brother was 10, I was eight. And my first experience of, of watching Sunderland was at Roker Park, 19, that would be 1982, I suppose. 
and uh, I was sitting there watching it in the director's box. So it's, it's quite strange because uh, it's, it's come full circle. I didn't think I would get this opportunity to work inside the football club. Um, you know, many years ago, I was rejected when I asked to be a mascot. So it's quite strange <laughs> how things change, but it's, it's very good to be on the inside having uh, and now feeling like I have a, an ability to influence the direction of travel. Uh, where, you know, over the last 20 years of, of working in football and working around some elite football people, uh, you get a, a very strong sense of best practice, the way that things should be done. And I feel like I've picked, picked up on a lot of that and um, now just starting, hopefully, to be able to put some of those things into practice at Sunderland. So for those who, who you know, aren't, maybe aren't in the business world, what, what is the non-executive director? How, how, how hands-on are you? Well, you, you're, you're supposed to really be someone who advises and consults and, and doesn't do too much else. Um, but if you spend any time with Tom and I, you'll realise that <laughs> that's pretty far from the truth. Now, listen, I think Tom and I were both frustrated and, and there's probably some of the other board members in, on this conversation somewhere. But I would say openly that uh, Tom and I were quite frustrated for the first few months because... Um, we were on the board, but not really getting to have much of an impact. And it's only through lockdown that that situation changed. Um, we got a, a proper seat at the table, really, um, and found that, that people were listening and were ready to listen. And we've been able to have a, a stronger influence. I mean, Tom will be able to talk about the things that he that he's involved with. I'm very much involved on the football side. I mean, that's that's what I know. That's that's I suppose my area of expertise. Having worked as a director. Uh, on the football side for three years at Oxford United previously and, and Oxford United, although, although a much smaller club, did a lot of things right in terms of the way they set themselves up around their recruitment practices and things like that. So th that's the kind of stuff that I have um, a, a regular input with. Um, Jim Rodwell has, has been um, a really important part in the development of the football club and I think has, has, has been very significant in some some really key decision making that's that's happened over the last few weeks and months um he certainly helped me um bringing everybody to the table to have those conversations and making sure our voices are heard and um long may it continue we, we're just starting out really but I, I feel i mean i did this breakfast thing with you jeff a couple of years ago at the start mm -hmm. of the championship season i think and i remember the fixtures came out and i thought i can't see where we're going to win a game honestly that i, I felt very pessimistic right back then about Sunderland and the direction of travel and I sit here now feeling incredibly optimistic about our chances and um, the way forward and I know that's not the, the kind of mood music of a lot of Sunderland fans but perhaps there perhaps we should be better at telling some good stories about what's happening at the football club because I, I feel pretty optimistic about the way we're going. Good stuff. Tom, um, similarly, what, what what areas are you involved with at the club now? Um, well, uh, so just I just want to just reiterate what Dave's saying. I mean, you know, there's been quite a few changes, uh, you know, over the club in the last sort of six or seven months um, in many areas, you know, um, academy, recruitment, etc. And uh, one of the things I've been involved in is uh, we, we, we're trying to take a bit more of a scientific look at, at the player recruitment, which has been handed over to Dave. And I know Dave's embracing that. And yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, when, when, when myself and David were invited on the board, I don't know what they were expecting, but I, I think we might get the shock in terms of, you know, well, well, yeah, I mean, listen, I'm from Sunderland, I'm a fan, I'm very, very passionate, I'm very, very, uh, I, I've got a certain standards and way, we, where we do things, and, uh, and yeah, and uh, it's not that the, the, the guys weren't like that, it's just, you know, Jim, I think Jim Red, Jim Rodwell said it the first time when we said, yeah, I like non-execs non because they can say what they feel. Well, he's damn right about that one, right? <laughs> and uh, so, so, we, so we have regular calls, discussions, fallouts, WhatsApps. We do all of that sort of stuff. Um, but I mean, I, I'm sort of more interested, if you like, in, in uh, I mean, I love the playing side of the course, but like I'm more keen to sort of get involved in the commercial side of the business, supporting the team in that sort of area. You know, we have we've made a few mistakes over the last couple of months. We're trying to put them right. I just think that, you know, there's a lot of things that it's been so difficult during COVID. It's it's just not always easy to communicate. And sometimes, when you don't say something, that's the best thing to say. You know, I know that sounds really really poor in terms of communication things that's come out of the club, but there's lots of things going on in social media, and it's sometimes best not to get involved. Uh, short and sweet, Jeff. You know. We're massively committed to making this club better, and and I think 
myself and David's outlook is not about just next season. It's about the longer term, you know, and the people that's coming into the club, the younger guys that's coming into the club. You know, we're, yes, we want to get out of the league, but we've got to get the foundations back to where we want to be. And that's very, very important to us. And you've got to make money as well. You've got to get the fans back, uh, um, you know, engaged with the club and that, you know. Uh, I'm not going to make excuses about the past. We're just, we're looking forward with it now. And uh, yeah, you know, and, and again, just getting involved with the fans. Crikey, just getting out there and having a pint and just, you know, just enjoying ourselves, getting in the Colliery Tavern, whatever you do, you know, on match day. That's the bit that we want to get back to. And it's, it looks like it's going to be a tricky couple of months, doesn't it? You know? Mm, indeed. I, I mean, Danny, from the, from the playing point of view, yeah. How how do they how do the players pick up from you know such a long period of, of inactivity and then suddenly bang you're into you know games two three games in you know coming quick in a week it's yeah I think that they'll have obviously been frustrated with how last season finished um, in terms of obviously missing out on the playoffs by a few points and then you know you you're devastated and then you're watching the other teams playing as you've touched on there it's, it's game after game for these lads. Um, for our players, they'll have been just ticking over, constant jogs, out jogging. I've seen a few of the boys actually having a jog around Durham, um, exercise bikes and this sort of stuff, really. But you, as, as we spoke earlier, you can't beat getting the boots back on, getting back out on the training pitch. And then, you know, you've got a focus point now of 12th of September. Get ready to go. That's when you know when you've got to be ready for. Obviously, I think they've got a, a friendly this weekend Is it against Gateshead, I think. Um, get themselves going, get the minutes in the legs, and and hopefully we hit the ground running at the start of the season and get off to a good start. Without fans, playing without fans, does how, how much does that affect you as a player? Yeah, it's it's difficult. I mean, again, touching on there, you watch the Premier League games, and if you know they put the the full sound on um, to try and make it better for the people watching at home. But you know, I've, I've played in pre-season games in over in Portugal and the States where you're playing in the big stadiums and there's no one in there and it's, it's echoey, you can hear what everyone's shouting uh, and it, it has got a bit of a feel of a, a pre-season friendly to it now. You have to have a strong mindset, I guess, of when you're going out there now, you know, someone used to getting 30 or thousand in League One, you know, they're going to run out of the stadium of lights, start the season with, with no one in there and it's going to be a big echoey stadium and you've got to try and put it to the back of your mind get out there, do what you paid for and to, to produce results and performances and get three points on the board for Sunderland. I think that's going to be fascinating, really, Jeff and Danny, you know, just about like this, you know, the, the, having the fans behind you, having the not fans. In my opinion, over the last couple of years, we've had players, a couple of players at the pitch that have actually struggled to play in front of a big crowd. You know, they've been better away from home. So again, I don't know, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm curious to see how that works out. But I think safe to say, um, you know, it's, it's, it's impossible to say at this stage there's going to be an advantage or a disadvantage, you know, but um, certainly, in my opinion, certain players mm. struggled with the expectation of that uh, crowd, you know, so... Uh, yeah. my, feeling is, my feeling is, Tom, that... Um, sorry, Danny. My feeling is, and, and this is what I've seen a little bit from the Premier League and watching Bundesliga early, was that the technical teams would, would prosper. And, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the difficult stadia that you go to where, where small grounds in, at this level where the fans could be really hostile and, and make life difficult, that's not going to be there. So I, I think if you've got a very good football team, you will prosper. And, and that's what uh, we've been talking about at a recruitment level. Uh, you know, you, you've got to have good footballers, footballers who are comfortable on the ball. Uh, we need pace in the team. Uh, we've got a very fit team, we know that, um, but we need to be the best team. And I think that it, it is a bit of a leveller <laughs> in the sense of the unpredictable elements of League One. So I would like to think that the better teams will will prosper and we'll certainly be one of those. Not much movement at the, at the minute, David, David, but what, someone who has come in, or who's come back is barely right. Didn't see an awful lot of them last year, but I think what we did see of them everyone was in, was impressed. How, how big a deal is that? How big a sign is that? It, it was um, absolutely fundamental. And, and when we sat down with Phil and talked about how we wanted to play this year, that was the first thing. Did we want to continue with the, with the tactics that served him well sort of post-Christmas last year? Bailey Wright was absolutely fundamental to that. And um, we, I think we saw the impact of losing Bailey in that game at Oxford. And 
you know, I think it unsettled us for a few games after that. Bailey's come back. He's looking really sharp. He's looking really hungry. And he's not just a very good footballer, but he's a fantastic communicator as well. Anyone who spent any time with him. He's a brilliant character. And I think Phil <coughs> really wanted that real leader in the dressing room. And we've got that in Bailey. So it's, it's, took, uh, it's ticking two boxes in one, if you like. And he sets the standards for everybody else. And um, what I would say is about training so far. I've watched a bit of it. Um, Sometimes the boys will record sessions and, and send them down to me so I can see what's going on. And uh, there is a real fight amongst the team. Um, they look very, very sharp. Phil is delighted with, with how uh, fit they all are. And, you know, you can, you can, be, you can be, think you're fantastic until you actually come up against any opposition. And we'll see the first, the first test of that on Saturday. But he couldn't be, be more pleased with the way things are going. And you say, that, you know, not a lot has happened, but... You have to remember that uh, the goalposts moved quite dramatically halfway through the recruitment window. And we, that was we suspected, <laughs> yeah, we suspected they might, but uh, you know, we were we were a long way down the road with with two players that uh, unfortunately we didn't manage to get done before uh, the vote happened on on salary caps, and and now it's really a, it's a big jigsaw puzzle. You've got twenty two slots for over twenty ones. Um, we obviously need. Um, three key positions and then it's about adding a little bit of what I call sparkle to the team uh, and that's what we talk with Phil about and, and as well going back to what Tom said about adding value to the club long term and building sustainability which this club has been without for a decade more uh, trying to avoid short-term signings where you can but there might be one or two little bargains that come up at the end of this period you know towards the start of the season where players that you you thought weren't within your reach now find themselves sitting on the backsides they're out of contract and and the glut of clubs that are willing to pay a lot of money for them have disappeared uh, yeah. so you might be able to pick up one or two short-term signings to help us get over the line because it is about getting that balance between uh, getting promotion this season which of course we all want to do and and building a, a more sustainable football team i mean i think we made a breakthrough yesterday on on one key target so hopefully we'll have news on that in the next 24 48 hours if we can get that done but um, there, are, there are lots of plates spinning right now, Jeff. Um, so, you know, all being well, we will add the numbers that Phil has talked about. It's a question for Danny, for me, this one, you know, because there's a lot of players out there, in my opinion, playing roulette here, you know, in, in the sense that um, Dave's right, the number of offers that's been made to people and people looking, you know, and, and fair enough, it's like anybody, isn't it? If somebody's you've got an opportunity potentially to pay in the championship for more money, you're going to do it, right? But... There's going to be a lot of players. I, 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 I don't know exactly what it's going to end up like because I'm sure I'm sure we'll bring some more in. But I just want to just go back a little bit, you know, on some of the people that we, you know, like some of the young guys that Dave's touched on. I think that's important. Wild and uh, Vinny Steers, these sort of guys. But we've got the likes of Scowan. I mean, he's only played four games for us. You know, like, we forget we've got a few players there that we haven't really seen. We've got Jack Diamond and these sort of people coming back. And like, what I like about it is I like the sort of like the the younger sort of people that uh, that's coming into it. That you know, it must be fantastic on that training pitch. They must be chomping at the bit, kicking each other in lumps. I just sense that that sort of thing is a really good thing, you know. And um, and again, you know, like so Denver and these sort of people, they're all a year more experienced. You know, I think, and if, I can't tell you specifically, but if you look at other clubs, um, you know, We've tied up uh, Maguire and Flanagan. You know they they were out of contract. We've got them back on as on board as well. All experienced, know the club inside out. Now, um, listening to Danny talking to Maguire, he's desperate for us to get out of this league. You know, so I'm just sort of saying, I don't. I'm sure we will bring some more people in. Dave's got a little one up his sleeve there. That's coming very, very soon. And I think the fans will be delighted with that one. But it's not that we haven't tried. We are trying. I just think the players are playing roulette, Danny. I mean, you know, what would you do in this position? Yeah, no, funny enough, I've, I've spoke to some lads who I've finished playing with a couple of seasons ago. There's four or five of these boys who are out of contract at the minute. Obviously, I think it's hit certainly League One, League Two and going down to the conference. Um, a lot of lads are out of contract and they'll be scrambling for, for clubs at the minute. And um, it's a bit cat and mouse, I think, in terms of some lads will be not happy with what they're being offered in terms of wages. So they're uh, rejecting offers, but in two or three weeks' time when they're obviously seeing lads who are back in training and they want to get sorted at a club and they're thinking, well, perhaps I should have took that offer. So it's a bit of a strange situation, I think, for, for teams and, and for players at the minute. But I think looking at Sunderland, when we've when we done the podcast with, uh, with the gaffer a couple of weeks ago and he touched on, he's still looking to add another a five on top of Bailey and Aidan O'Brien. And I think 
looking at the squad from my point of view on the outside, I think we have got a good core of the squad there now, ready to go for next season, With it, as, you, as Dave's touched on. One or two little bits of magic, if you like, up the other end of the pitch where we can add to it. Obviously, Elliot Emelton getting back fully fit. I played with Elliot a couple of seasons ago at Grimsby. I think he's a good, talented player in and around the box. Uh, two good feet. Getting fit, he's, he's like a, a fresh signing, isn't he, coming back into the squad. And obviously, you know, you're, you're more in the loop than me in terms of where you're at with, uh, with future signings coming in. And I'm guessing that the, the wage cap has put a, a bit of a hindrance on, on targets yeah. what you have lined up. And Particularly at the top of the end of the pitch, Danny. Particularly at the top end of the pitch, because yeah. that's, that's, that is yeah. where it is tough, because players will expect um, bigger wages than the, the salary cap would allow right now. Um, and yeah. that's why where, where I'm talking about this, this jigsaw puzzle, this chess game that you have to put the pieces in the right place. I mean, just, just to, to recap what you're saying there, Elliot Embleton is coming back. He's flying in training. You don't want to put yeah. too much pressure on the lad, but he looks really good. Yeah. Jack Diamond is, is training with the first team group, you know, on a daily basis, really, for the first time. He looks a fantastic prospect and, and we, we've got to look after him. And Dan Neal, the same. He stepped up. He's training with the group. Um, he looks a very accomplished central midfield player, you know. So there, there are lots of positives around. And, and you know, these under-21s, and by the way, we're working as hard to, to bring in targets for the academy um, as we are for the first team group. But these under-21s now have, have got real bonus value. So if you can get some good young players, um, you know, you, you're on the right path, absolutely. Yeah. Just, you know, just last point, top. Jeff, sorry, just, just last point. I'm just saying the lads that we're, we're talking about here as well, the lads that want to be here, and, you know, like, again, I think, not, I'm not criticising the fancy, I'm just saying, all of us, and I'm guilty of it, we've got short memories of some of the people that we've had in the last sort of 10 seasons here, you know, coming through the door. Everybody saw Corny's attitude when he was walking through there. These guys are, like, chomping at the bit, and, um, you know, it's been touched up. We just need to get, sort of, we need to get, we need to get off to a good start, obviously. We just need to get behind them. And uh, I, I just think, when, when we're, like, as one like that, I, I, I don't think there's many better places, in the, well, there isn't any better place in the country. You know, it's not a cliche, that's a fact. We do have the fixtures coming up very shortly, but I ju just to keep this conversation going, um, obviously the salary cap puts a greater emphasis on bringing youngsters through the academy, but with the club being in the position that it's in, in, in League One, how, how difficult is it to, to hold on to youngsters who you know, get Premier League clubs sniffing around them at 16 and 17? It, it's really tough, and it's a challenge that we're really working on, Jeff. And, and I'd be lying if I said I was happy with the business that's, that's gone on over the last uh, few months, years, um, with the academy, because we've lost some, some very promising players, and that's hugely disappointing. And it, it's... Um, it's something that we're working on. Uh, you know, we've made some changes within the academy. Um, we are going to make some more changes in the academy. We're going to appoint a new head at the academy. And um, it has to be a, a, a learning process from the entire football club, the value of, of getting very good young players who want to play for Sunderland and giving them a, seeing, letting them see a pathway from 12 years old to the first team, which, which perhaps hasn't been there. Um, Phil is absolutely embracing this as well and you know uh, he, he'll be a vital component in, in making sure that the parents of these, these lads are convinced as well that they can have a, a very exciting future with Sunderland so um, yeah the academy is, is I have to say that Jeff the, the academy is really important to us moving forward. I, I was at Wembley actually for the, uh, for the, the National League playoff final where, to see Harrogate and Jack Diamond did look Quite, I don't know it's at that level, but he looked a decent player, great goal. I think it was voted Harrogate's goal of the season. Um, hardly surprising, it's the one that got them in the Football League. But um, he did look like someone who couldn't certainly play in League One. Yeah, have you watched him, Danny? I've caught a bit of the game, the final, yeah. Um, I think, yeah, you know, obviously it's done his experience a world of good. I think I've, I've touched on it before, Dave. I think too many lads are quite happy to sit around the academies. Uh, especially, you know, look at Sunderland's facilities and they sit there, they're happy playing Saturday morning, you know, 18s, 21s football. Uh, I think it's good for these lads to go out early, get some experience, you know, play men's football, if you like, and toughen them up, get them in the real world, you know, playing at stadiums in front of a few thousand fans and, and get some ready. And, and obviously Jack's done that last season. He's gone out and he's, he's had a good season. He'll come back now, confident after the season he's had. And he'll be, he'll be fancying his chances and pushing himself to try and, to try and get into the squad this season and try and get a few games under his belt. He's very dynamic. He can just go 
uh, get the ball in, in space and boom, he's away a couple of yards, a little burst. And, and the other thing, good thing about Jack and, and also Embleton is the pressure then, then they put on Gucci Maguire. That's the way of football, you know, um, competition for places. I think we've got fixtures, haven't we, Jeff? We have got some fixtures, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Doing your job for you, but go on. Carried away here. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Uh, first game. Bristol Rovers at home on Oof, September, the, uh, September the 12th. I think anyone who saw the Premier League fixtures wouldn't realise Newcastle were away would have guessed it would be a home game too. Uh, Did you say Bristol Rovers at home, Jeff? Bristol Rovers at home. Well, I was at the last game with Sunderland played, which was Bristol Rovers away, and we were absolutely awful. I, yeah. I was being polite there. So, like, you know, lost, lost I wish we uh, it's that, you know, if the players, and I'm telling them now, if they can't remember how bad we were that game, you know, and the goal great, great is on those, those, those last few games sort of undid the whole of the season's work, didn't they? Because the club just dropped out of the playoff spots. And, uh... Well, again, Jeff, just quickly, I just want to say that it's, it's about the players. You know, we had a few players on the pitch that day, a few short-term, short-term signings, in my, my opinion. Different, different fixture. That's the, if Danny will tell you, if that's a game that you'd want, you get beat, you've been really bad. That's the game, your first game that you want to play. I think this is really yeah, interesting, fine. Jeff, because oh, we've been talking fine. about... Sorry, Danny, we should be talking about, you know, oh. how well we can look in training and whatever, but we will know a lot about our team after four games of this season. Yeah. Uh, Bristol Rovers at home, Oxford United away, Peterborough home and Charlton away. Uh, that's yeah. probably yeah. As, as tough as you can have as a start, I would say. Mm, certainly is. Uh, already there's what, how many? One, two, three, four, five. Seven games in October and that, that doesn't include any sort of cup matches that are going to be... Uh, mm going to be thrown in there. Uh, other ones to look out for, Boxing Day. Home on Boxing Day, that's always a good sign against Hull City, which uh, I think that was a Premier League game on Boxing Day not so many years ago, wasn't it? About four or five years ago. Um, the year ends away at Accrington Stanley. There's a nice trip. Uh, New Year, it's, not, it's January the 2nd, isn't it? The Saturday, away at Northampton, uh, which I think would be first time mm. in a long time that... Uh, the club's played, played Northampton and hasn't played at the new, new ground either. Uh, other games to look out for. The season ends at home to Accrington Stanley. Oh, no, it doesn't. It's uh, home to Northampton. Oh, this sort of uh, symmetry. Home to Northampton. Uh, the week before that, it's a long trip down to Plymouth. Well, well here, here's, here, this could be an omen then, Jeff. Uh, Northampton Town, um, for people with a long memory... I was at the game, it was a bank holiday and it was at Roker Park and it was the game at home that Sunderland got promoted. Maybe we're not promoted, but won the league. Won the league, um, that's right. Yeah, right. and when we were last, or you know, the previous occasion, we were in uh, this, this level. 30,000 were there at Roker Park and I was there. Yeah, that's a good, good memory. Uh, Gates and Gabbiadini, I'm guessing, and probably I think John McPhail. Did John McPhail get a penalty as well? He yes, got lots I think of he penalties. Did. Uh, yeah, lots of penalties that season. Oh, there we go. Look, well done, Kate. There we are. Thank you. You can I was just thinking everything. when you're talking about the fixtures then, you're talking about Ac Accrington. And I mean, I would have been there with Kate when we got wet down at Accrington last year and all that sort of stuff. And listen, no, we said it before, no disrespect to a lot of these teams and things like that. In a strange way, I did enjoy the first season going to all of these games away on different grounds and bits and pieces. I missed about four or five last season. But um, yeah, them first four games, I mean, you couldn't have a better sort of, um, you, you know... It's all about how you start, isn't it? You know, I was listening to Troy Deeney briefly yesterday, starting about Watford season. Yet, you know, now it's all about the start. You've got to get after a good start, and um, crikey, we're going to need to be right at it to get a good start we'll against them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Danny, can I just ask a question to you? Because uh, uh, yeah. Grant Ledbetter said this to me: it was our last uh, last season home games and uh, pre-season we played South Shields, and he said like pros tend it tends to be sort of you know like Septemberish uh, sort of end. Start of the season, August, says September before you're really feeling with games and that. One of the things that we haven't yeah. got this season, we haven't got a lot of pre season games, so it's going to be like no. straight at it. Straight at the ground running, as you say. And then you look at the fixtures there October, seven, seven league games there, isn't it? There to go straight into it. So it's going to be tough. Uh, that's why I'm touching on the squad there and uh, the depth of the squad will be important and the quality. And um, on top of that, you know, Carabao Cup and the, you know, the, the games are thick and fast. So it's going to be tough. Um, like you say, not an ideal start. They're obviously favourites and stuff, but it doesn't always plan out that way. Um, but we're, we're one of the favourites, so you've got to back yourselves to go out there and do the job. 
another seven games over uh, through December as well. That is a December really well. punishing uh, sort of winter yeah. winter period coming up. Um, uh, how, generally, uh, how do we feel about the uh, the season ahead? Um, I mean, last last season, I think everyone, just about every fan, thought playoffs minimum, um, and it did look like that was how it was going to going to be until those last few games. Um, d- d- be just sort of turning back. Did everyone feel just a little bit cheated the way the, the season ended? That um, you know the club, the way, the way the club was squeezed out of the playoffs. Everybody was going to vote the way for themselves. Everybody. So, like, I mean, I don't think we can blame anybody for that. You know, I mean, we, we, we they might as well have not had the vote. We knew what was going to happen anyway. We weren't Sorry. good enough from the start of the season. That's why we didn't get promoted last year. You know, as Tom's absolutely right. Um, I would say that that we we feel like we should be right up there. I mean, we, we would take the view of where we're at as as probably the team um, post Christmas. You know, post Christmas we had a, a very strong run where we were. Uh, Tom might be able to tell me we were averaging at least two points a game um, mm-hmm. in that in that spell, and I would say that has got to be uh, the absolute starting point for where we are, and and it's the challenge yeah. for us as a recruitment team is to improve the quality of the players that we've got and, and add a bit of a gloss to it. Uh, you know, just thinking about who we're going to be up against. Uh, I'd be very confident against Bristol Rovers at home, Oxford United away. I think they're going to be one of the, the prime contenders. You know, they were a bit of a surprise to a lot of people last year. It was no surprise to me they were up there. They're a very yeah. good football team. Good um, and they've recruited really well again. Uh, Peterborough United uh, are cock a hoop because they think they've got some of the best under 21s going. So what that means is if you don't have to have 22 um, players over 21 in your squad, you can perhaps have 18 and you can use the money and then spread it out a, a bit more so you can pay people a little bit more than the average salary cap. So they're going to be right up there. Charlton, a bit of an unknown quantity because we, we don't know what's happening with them off the field and how that's going to impact on them uh, for the start of this season. Um, but they would certainly be among the contenders. Portsmouth, again, of course. Ipswich Town, we found ourselves, I think, competing with a lot of the same players that, that they've, been, they've been going in for. Uh, Fleetwood did very well last year. I think Doncaster will be better. Burton will be better. Wigan were a mid-table championship team last year, in effect. Um, so what are they going to be this time, having sold a lot of their players? Um, I've said, City Dave, will, 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 yeah. those, uh, will some of those teams be st- as strong as they were last year? I mean, in some cases, they're going to have different teams, aren't they? You know, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm, I mean, and that's, that, that's the thing, the point, Jeff, that I'm trying to say is that, you know, I think we've kept pretty much the core that we wanted to keep anyway together. Whereas, I, I, like I said, I'm not close to every other person's team there, out there, you know, but I just feel that we're going to be, I think we're in a, a very decent position, but I always feel like that, Jeff. You know, I mean, like, you know, going back, you're talking about we've got new sponsors this year uh, on the shirts. We did that a couple of years ago. First game we ever sponsored was Sunderland uh, versus Charlton at home, live on Sky. And Gooch hits that in the back of the net. I mean, that's what we want. Isn't it? You know, we want a bit more of that. We're not going to have the fans there for all of that sort of stuff. But um, it's not far away, you know. And without looking too far ahead, how, how much bigger now because of the salary cap is the step up from League One to the Championship. I mean, we saw Charlton come straight back down, Barnsley and Luton only only just stay up. I mean, it does seem now, it's it's almost that, that step from League One to the Championship is almost as big as the one from the Championship to the Premier League. It's, big, it's a big step. Um, and it, it's, yeah, it's, it's a 16 million <laughs> budget step at the moment, which is not insignificant. I think I would take the view uh, which hopefully everyone else who's in, involved with recruitment would share, that we want to take players now that can come with us. Um, you know, yeah. And it's about identifying now in our processes uh, and through the course of the next six months, players that, that we can uh, add if we do get to the championship and, and not being knee-jerk when we get there and seeing what's around. It's about targeting now. And, and actually getting a, a plan in place, which has probably been lacking. You know, I think the reality is it we've been leaping, lurching, probably a better word, from window to window for the last few years. Um, so, yeah, it, it is a big leap. Well, the, the last 400 in there, uh, yeah, 100% agree with Dave there. I mean, the teams in the championship last year trying to get into the premiership lost £482 million. So, like, um, for, let's forget about that for now. I think Dave's right. We just need to have a longer-term view with some of the players. It might it, listen. We've got to get up to this league. 
don't get me wrong, but I'm just saying with some of the uh, recruitment, you know, we want them to be able to step up and, and add to it next year. That's where it's got to be. Um, and, you know, everybody talks about it in football, but how Brentford and these sort of teams have recruited well, data-driven sort of recruitment. That's 100% where I want to be, and that's where Dave wants to be with it. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're touching on it, and um, and everybody's falling out about it and agreeing and to disagree. And, and, but, like, we're moving forward. It's just that the situation at the moment is... It's ridiculous, and there's a lot, a lot of businesses in a worse situation than Sunderland Football Club, and, and people losing their jobs and things like that. So we have to have a, a sense of realism, you know. But I mean, we've got a game on Saturday. I get it, you know. It, streaming. Can you imagine how many people would have been there if we, if you could have went to the game? It would have been fantastic, you know. And I know there's a game at the Stadium of Light coming up, uh, 25th. That'll come. There'll be a bit more detail come out on that very, very shortly. No fans there, but I'm. I'm, I'm well, they are going to stream it, so the fans will be at least have a look at what we're talking about here, you know. And it's great, isn't it, just to see them playing again, you know. Absolutely. And Danny, as a, as a player, when the, when the fixtures come out, uh, did, did the players all, all sit around looking at them, looking, picking out games that they're interested in? Yeah, I think you always look at the first game of the season, whether you're home or away, um, and looking down the list, your rivals, really. So, obviously, your, your Peterborough's, Portsmouth, these type of teams where you're going to be playing those, and... Christmas around Christmas time really as a, as a player you know obviously a lot of the time you're in hotels on, on Christmas night or Christmas Eve and, and stuff and so you're, you're looking at those key fixtures really New Year's Day as well and then obviously uh, the last game of the season to see where you react and hopefully from, from Sunderland's point of view it'll be a, a deciding game one way or other or we may have it wrapped up by then in terms of getting promoted. Right. First, first games that you played in, first games in the season, any for, for Sunderland, anyone set, set stand out? Uh, I remember a championship game against Coventry away, um, the Rico Arena. It was a, felt like about forty-five degrees. I remember that one. Usually, the first first game of the season, it's always red hot. Um, remember that one now. I think who else we played for now? Bolton away for Sunderland. I think Darren Bent got his first goal for us with under Bruce. We won one 0 away at Bolton. Um, that was a cool one, but. No, as a few, as you say, you just you tend to look, obviously. The lads all have seen the fixtures this morning coming out and, you know, know that the old Bristol Rovers won for a lot of the boys that were here last season, which there are, um, you know, got beat away there last last game before the lockdown, wasn't it, I think. So, mm. they'll be wanting to put that one right and then you get stuck into those those next three tough games after that. You know, Oxford, Peterborough are not going to be easy. So, it's a tough start, but, you know, we've got to, got to back ourselves. And, and psychologically, as a player, how, how important is it to win that first game to get three points on the board as soon as possible? Well, it, it is. I mean, obviously, it's disappointing that you know the fans aren't going to be in there. You'd be thirty thousand plus Sunderland fans in there, I'm sure. Um, you know, getting behind the boys, but they're not going to be. They'll be watching on the tellies and the pubs or whatever. And uh, it's vital that you know get off to a good start, confidence in the changing rooms, um, and then you kick on from there. There's nothing worse than you know getting beat first game of the season and. You've done all that prep in pre-season. You've worked on shapes, formations, different players. And then if you go and get a hide in first game of the season, it's back to the drawing board in a way, really. So we need to hopefully have a good plan in place. You know, the lads are, as Dave's touched on, looking good in training and, and they hit the ground running. I think you said you've spoken to Phil on the, uh, Phil Parkinson on the, on the podcast. Um, yeah. How is he? How is he looking forward to it? He seemed, he seemed uh, upbeat and happy with the way things were progressing. Obviously, I think they were two weeks into pre-season when we spoke to him. And, uh, you know, as he said, he said the boys had come back looking sharp and fit, um, keen and eager to get the balls out, as, as you usually are in pre-season, once you've done all the hard slogging running. Um, and that they'll be looking forward to Saturday now, tomorrow, getting the, getting the first sort of pre-season game under their belt, knowing that, what are we, three weeks away now, are we, from the first game of the season? So... That's the target. Get the fitness levels ready. Uh, hopefully injury-free with the majority of the squad and and a good competition for for the starting eleven. And generally, how do you how do you feel about the club's prospects for this season? Yeah, I'm, you know, confident you've got to be. I think you know we are. You look at paper there, we're the favourites, but you know, papers never won a game of football. Um, Got to back ourselves, you know. Big club in League One. There's some big teams in there, and it's not going to be easy. You know, Wigan's Hulls have come down from the Championship, so there's a, you know some other tough teams to to compete against in there. But from our point of view, as, as I've said, we've got to go with the mindset of we're Sunderland. We're a good big team in League One, and we've got to put things right. And you know, third third season in League One now, which is unacceptable in a way. Um, 
and get ourselves back up into the championship and go from there and, and try and get a bit of a solid base to the club. And Dave and Tom, feeling quietly confident or noisily confident? <laughs> Um, well, from my side, Tom, Tom's before, always noisy. Yeah, from from my side, I mean, uh, before I got in, involved in the uh, board, I was allowed to have a bet, and I've had significant amounts of money on Sunderland the last two seasons, so they owe me. I'm not, I can't, I'm not allowed to have a bet now. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you talk. I, I'm the same as Danny. I mean, I think Hull will be strong, um, but I, I genuinely think that a lot of sides in the league are going to be weaker. We just don't know. You can't really call this one and say that. Well, they have added strength, or. I think it's more a case of, I think it's this, for me, it's about retention and, uh, and, and adding quality. And I think, like I said, for us, it was clear as mud to me last season. Uh, we went on that great run. Don't forget, you know, the way we played last season, uh, you know, it, it's obviously a negative towards the end of that. But, you know, we don't, we, we don't need to, to get 20 or 30 points more. We need to get 10 you know, and uh, like adding, it's it's all for me. It's all incremental changes, and uh, and I think we've got a solid squad. We're going to add some quality. Another one coming in very very soon. Hopefully a couple more. But like you, like I said, you don't. Ha- um, I think we've got a good retained squad. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see what uh, everybody else does. And again, you know, we've got to back the manager, back the fans. Sorry, back the uh, back the players. And um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure if they're not doing it, we'll let them know. You know, but I mean, they've got to deal with our expectation. And I said it before to Danny, um, you know, it's going to be different. But like, if you can't get yourself up to to to, to win these games, you know, um, you shouldn't be here. And uh, I, I don't think we've got people. I, th- I think we've got people that want to be here. And that's the key. I think we've got it. We, I'm, I'm pretty confident um, because I think we do have a, a strong nucleus. And what I would say is about the, the previous recruitment team. They've left some diamonds at the football club. Um people who are very consistent performers for us, people who, who, as Tom was alluding to earlier, really want to be at Sunderland. Uh, and it's about finding more of those gems, really. Um, gems that you can polish a little bit and create value in your football club and, and come on the journey with you. You know, I think we do have a strong nucleus. I think we should have... Uh, Jim Rodwell's just messaging me. <laughs> we should have one. Uh, one more, hopefully, today, and maybe even two. And, um, and then I think we just need a few more pieces to fall into place and that will happen over the course of the next few weeks fingers crossed great stuff and a, a couple of pre-season games did you, did you think there's, a, there's another one to come is there Tom yeah, it's a, we're, we're play, we're, well, again, and you know, you think, well, why we're being so secretive about this? It's, 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 there's, there's lots of things. It's, I'm going to bore you, right? But like, you know, the ground, people being on furloughed, we've got to take all the sponsorship stuff down. You've got to get the new sponsors in there. You can't do certain things. Um, I'm pretty certain the game uh, next Saturday, the 25th, is going to be screened for the fans and that, you know. And uh, hey, you promised now, Tom. You promised. Uh, well, well, I mean, like I said, uh, that, that's what we've been talking about over the last couple of days. But it's not just a case of let's let's do this anymore, Jeff. It's you've got to go through certain protocols, you know. I mean, even who gets into the ground, all that sort of stuff. We're, we're no different to everybody else. And, you know, you've seen a few things that's happened with other football teams up in Scotland where things have they've, they've, set the, they've gone backwards because they've done things wrong. Players doing silly things, bits and pieces like that. We, we, we're just, we're, we're cautiously optimistic that, uh, you know, uh, sorry, not cautiously optimistic. We're going to be playing next Saturday and the fans will be able to watch it. Mm-hmm. And if you've got any complaints, speak to Jim Rodwell. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there any steer at all when fans will be allowed back in is it we're we... all working on the same thing the same presumption jeff i think that that october at the mm. earliest uh, and the guys are working really really hard i can tell you that behind the scenes to to see what's possible you know are we talking about 30 percent uh, occupancy are we talking about 25 percent you know they are doing everything they can to make sure that as many people that want to be in the stadium um will be uh, be allowed to do so and and you know tom's right this is what it's all about ultimately it's about giving people something to look forward to. You know, I, over lockdown, I did speak to a lot of the um, Sunderland fans. I phoned, um, I was making phone calls to a lot of the older Sunderland fans, and it, it just it, dawned, it made me realise, or you know, uh, that that realisation that that for a lot of people, this football club is their life, and you know, everything the football club does is important to them, and they just want to be able to come to games again be part of that match day routine, wherever it is, go for their pint, come, come and have their pie and, and, and watch a game of football and, and hopefully watch their team that they can be proud of again. Great stuff. 
Uh, gents, I think that probably covers everything. Um, thanks so much for, uh, for being great guests today. Uh, Tom Sloan, David Jones and Danny Collins, 40, not so long ago. I can't believe it, Danny. Still look, still yeah. looking youthful. Still looking like just so and can we just say, you know, it, 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 been, I've done a lot of conference calls and Dave does a lot as well. And Dave had a, a Bobby Moore sort of, I, I've just got to say, at least I've got some Sunderland memorabilia in the back end here. <laughs> Danny's got his 15 pairs of trainers, right, which we can see. And uh, we'll, we'll not mention the mirrors and what goes on in there. That's, uh, that's, that's for another day. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much yeah. for being superb guests. Everyone out there, I hope you enjoyed the, uh, the rather unusual uh, Foundation of the Light Fixtures Breakfast. And we do hope that it's going to be a good season and we hope we see you all in the Stadium of Light very soon. Thanks again. Take care. Oh, well, Thank that's... you, Jeff. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks. Thanks, Danny. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks. Cheers up.